Um, so I was called to ministry at 13 years old. Um, at 13, I wrestled with this thing until I was 16. I had a conversation uh, with uh, Phyllis Hilliard, Pastor Phyllis Hilliard, who was the first lady of our church. And I said, you know, I think God has called me to preach. And she told me, just make me one promise. I said, well, what is it? She said, don't make God wait until you've done everything else before you yield to what God is calling you to do. And so ultimately, I didn't go looking. It, it found me. Right, full-time ministry found me and, and in that conversation, I said, but I win mistakes that I made coming in because I made assumptions about leadership that I wish, like, you know, in hindsight, as I look back, I'm saying, well, I wish I had known that before I started, but I'm glad I know it now. And, and one of those things is that position doesn't presuppose co cooperation. I wish I had like $20 for every time somebody told me that, that I was not, right? Like you're not even, but yet here I am. The, the measure of success is how many people showed up. Not you, it's easy to slip into that mentality and not think about the measure of success actually being the number of lives that are transformed. Right, the number of lives that are changed, the number of people that walk away from you being able to walk with God on their own because they spend some time with you, right? Hello, my sisters. Hello, hello, and hello. Oh my goodness, y'all. We are blessed on today. Now, wait a minute, guess viewing audience, viewing audience. We know you're there, but let us know that you're present so we can do our shout outs to you. Let us know where it is that you're listening from. So our sisters, we got Dr. Carolyn Carlisle with us today. Dr. Carlisle, how are you? Come on, tell us. Oh my God. How so are you? Fill us in on your neck of the woods. Let us know where you where it is that you let the audience know where where, where it is you're streaming from. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As she works as she works with that. We'll come back to her. Um, Dr. Wright, tell us, um, how was your birthday week? How did it end? We know that those Chiefs won. They pulled that game <laughs> out on Sunday. I, I got all of your messages you sent me. Okay, let me just say that. I got all of them. All right. <laughs> well, but Dr. Burns, the reason I sent you those messages is because I was sure that next to the Dallas Cowboys, the Chiefs oh. were your favorite. Okay. Okay, let's just stay with your team. Okay, let's just okay. Don't 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 mention my team. We just stay. We just talk about your team. Okay, but all right. Auntie Pastor, I was thinking of the sisterhood. Oh, that now you just come come on now you let's try it again. Okay, so I see your chief won. All right, and so how was your birthday? We let's try this again because see y'all feel confused. <laughs> My birthday was absolutely wonderful. I had an exciting time, a blessed time, and and so enjoyed the clip that you did for me on my birthday with timely wisdom. And you did so, as always a beautiful job. So I'm very grateful. And so, uh, but what about them chiefs? <laughs> Wonderful. They did a wonderful yes. thing, didn't they? They pulled it out. So we want to, Barama Smith, we want to shout out to you. Hello, Yomi Clark, Chris Cheryl McDaniel, Saw Rock, so good to see you. Uh, Jackie Harris, I'm Brenda. Oh, Dr. Brenda Skillman. Hey, Hi, Jackie Skillman. So good to have you with us. Um, Natalie Davis, oh, so good to have you with us. On today, um, Christina. Hello, Christina. You faithful. Oh my goodness, we're so proud. You know what? We're gonna have to have you on so you can talk about your very books that you have. I'm so proud of you, yeah. Christina, and everything that you're doing. Marjorie Scott, uh, Tammy Dago. Oh, yes, and Ashley and Mary Mabry. All right, so thank you all. Let us know that you are here. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna leave that alone. Uh, Dr. Wallace, how are you on today? Oh, Russian, Russian, Russian. Doing great, doing great, doing great. How you guys doing? Loving, loving, loving being home during the day for a while. Hey now. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to turn on some light. Looks like I'm a little dark here. Okay. Turn on some light for us. Turn on. Oh, that's turn off the lights that came on. And turn, she's turning on some lights. Okay. Never mind. All right. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Bradford, how, how you doing? I, I'm okay, I think. <laughs> I think that's a little better. Doing all right, all is well. Cowboys almost pulled it out, but they look good. Yeah, they our team looks good. Don't talk know. About the Falcons. I, oh, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a rough yeah. game. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, that, that game was rough. Yes, yes, it was. And so I know Carlisle um, was on for a moment. She seemed to be having some technical challenges. We know we, I'm excited about her coming back and uh, joining us because we don't get an opportunity often to have all of us on at the same mm. time. Yeah. And so um, this, is, this is really good. I do, have you all noticed this? And I saw the notice, it came across my phone, but it says now that our death and infection rates from COVID are as high as they were last year. Yeah, they're exceeding that number, and um, mm -hmm. um, I am a big I'm a I'm a huge football fan. I grew up in an area that was just heavy in football, so I'm a huge football fan. Um, University of Georgia, my Bulldogs, love those, and y'all know I love my Cowboys. And uh, but I have to say that when Georgia played Clemson, I sat. I, 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 when I turned the TV on and they opened up the stadium, the game was held in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm. I was horrified. Yeah, yeah. I was horrified. Cowboys there were 80,000, over 80,000 fans, Georgia and Clemson fans. I did not one mask. Everyone's mm -hmm. packed in there together, mm -hmm. shouting and breathing. And I'm going, okay, we in America are acting like we are no longer in a pandemic. We're, right. we're acting like and and but we are now dealing with the delta variant and now it's as as a company would say it's subsidiaries yeah. that are more contagious than than what we were dealing with last summer this time and and we're acting we're just we're acting like we're there's 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 absolutely period that, that, yeah that, that we're beyond this now <laughs> Um, Dr. Burns, you're absolutely right because it was the same way that I was a little horrified as I was watching the Chiefs game and yeah. people were intermingling and interacting. And my understanding is there are now 10 different strains more mm -hmm. in there than the Delta variant that are operating. And yeah. we, we, we must be wise. We must be wise. Just yeah. uh, it shouldn't take you to lose a loved one to decide you're going to get a vaccination. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Go ahead, Doctor Brown. No, no, you're fine. Go ahead. No, you, yeah, it, 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 I think Doctor Brown. What I think I was hearing to say that it doesn't make sense. And um, in Texas, and this was last week's number that you know it, we we don't hear about it or people have become numb to the news. Mm -hmm. But 200 people a day in Texas. Mm -hmm. Are dying yeah. from COVID. Over two hundred a, a day, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Well, me Over two hundred now, that and that's a, that's, a, that, yeah. that's one. That's we're talking mm -hmm. about one disease mm -hmm. is killing over two hundred people a day. Yeah, a day. There are so many lawsuits though stating that they shouldn't have to wear masks, they shouldn't have to do this, but. I, my mind goes back to when I was a kid. It was a mandate before we can get into school that we had to have that had to be vaccinated. Well, so I just in it. But the so thing that gets me, me is to understand yeah. that okay, so now you're making this political. But there were maybe six shots that we had to get prior to going into school, and then at 15 you had to have another vaccination to return back to class. So what? What's the problem? The flu. Now we have a virus. So get the shot. Yeah. Get vaccinated. You know, or, or, or wear a mask. Or just... I, come on. I grew up in the 1950s and 60s, and polio was rampant. Exactly. Rampant. The vac they have a vaccination for it now. It was required <laughs> for everyone to get vaccinated. How many people you know have polio? Thank you, Rochelle. Mm -hmm. Who has polio mm -hmm. today? 
You don't know. I, and, right, right. And, and, then, and Wallace, is and not only, wait, and Wallace, and not only who has the polio, and we thank God for that, but how many kn knew what was in the shot? No, no, That's no. what I'm saying. What no, was no, it? No, what no. were the ingredients? No, you no, took no. the shot. No. And so you didn't have a question to ask, though. What what is it now that people there's this saying people? Well, I don't know. I may wake up as a zombie. If you're a zombie, you ain't waking up. Yeah. So I mean, but I, I, I'm just saying that that's just foolish, foolish. <laughs> that's foolish talking. Stop talking so foolishly and just do what you are supposed to do to keep not only yourself safe but everyone around you safe. It yeah. does not make sense. Now we have children that are getting this this virus that can't even get vaccinated. Oh they can't get vaccinated until they're 12 years old. This does not Kill make them. sense. Yes, they're killing okay. our children. Yes, 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 yes. Because I guess I'm every too. time everybody that doesn't take the virus, the it, it mutates. And it's looking for somewhere to go. So yes. mm -hmm. give right. me a it's break. <laughs> Either, you, okay, you don't want to get vaccinated. Wear a mask. Oh, you don't want to ma wear a mask. Stay at home. Oh, you don't want to stay at home? Uh-uh. Wait a minute. Natalie, Natalie Davis said the most non-smart thing I heard someone say was that students can't learn with the face mask on. Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay. Well, you all, we can, we can it's, it's sit down and introduce the guests. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 are, um, we have a wonderful and delightful uh, guest um, with us on today. I'm very pleased I saw that uh, to sure. be able um, to, to introduce um, her on today. Um, the Reverend Dr. Shazetta Thompson-Hill is a native of Flint, yeah. Michigan. And she is the youngest of five children. Uh, she might be the shortest, I'm sorry, the youngest of five children born to the Reverends um, Hank and Carmen Thompson. Uh, Dr. Hill, get ready for the shame, baby. <laughs> she, is, she is married to the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Hill, and together their parents are two sons, Isaac, 18, and Alex. Um, uh, Dr. Hill acknowledged the call of God on her life at the age of 16. Uh, she was licensed to preach at Can Creek Missionary Baptist Church in Jackson, Tennessee in 06, under the leadership of Apostle Larry Robinson and Prophetess Teresa Robinson. Uh, she is well-educated. Uh, she has a BA in mass communications from Lane College. Uh, she has a Master's of Divinity from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Uh, she has a Master's of Social Work and a Master's of Education from Lo Loyola. A university in Chicago, and she has a doctorate of ministry degree from the Perkins uh, School of uh, Theology. Uh, she has uh, traveled um, very much. Uh, now she is, says she began her, her journey um, under Apostle Robinson. Um, she then became a member of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church under the Reverend uh, now presiding elder LaVisha Williams. Um, from there, she's moved around in Indiana uh, she served in the 3rd Episcopal District and the 1st Episcopal District. I had the distinct opportunity of having her as an associate pastor uh, with me at Christian Chapel, Temple of Faith in Dallas, uh, Texas. And so I um, do want to get to this part because we want to hear a little bit about it today, that she did her doctoral work um, on a very crucial piece. I believe she'll talk about it on today. Um, but she's a documentary filmmaker and an author known for her passion for social justice and activi activism. Uh, she's been active in Ferguson, Baltimore, Prairie View, Flint, um, and in other places. And she brings a fresh perspective to what it means to do ministry as the body of Christ, often saying that the church is called to pray and be present. And so, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, our viewing audience of Timely Wisdom on today, very pleased to present uh, the Reverend Dr. Shazetta Thompson Hill hey, as our hey, guest oh. on today. Hey, 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 good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. She is a proud member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Uh, <laughs> that may not have been written, but I felt like I needed to say it for a few folks in the room. In the room, good afternoon. <laughs> Hey. Just need to get in there, baby. Ah, ah. That's all right. Represent, girl. 
right. Hey, y'all. How are you? So, Dr. Hill, I like to, to um, begin the conversation. Um, we miss you here in Dallas, uh, Texas. You, you served um, just phenomenally mm -hmm. well as our associate pastor at uh, Christian Chapel, uh, Temple of Faith. Um, but now you, you have the distinct opportunity of not only um, serving and working at Georgetown University, but you are also now the, the dean of uh, the doctorate of ministry program at Colgate, uh, Rochester in New York. And so what, what has this transition been like for you, um, leaving Dallas, Texas, but yet now floodgates wide open that you're actually on the <laughs> dealing with the campuses of two prestigious universities, both Georgetown and Colgate. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, first, good afternoon, ladies, and thank you uh, for having me. I said to my husband, um, I get to sit at the grown-ups table with the aunties today, um, and so I'm excited to be here. So thank you all uh, for the opportunity to be here with you. Um, this transition season has been, uh, I, the word I've adopted is uncanny. It's been absolutely, it's it's felt crazy at times. Um, the transition has been uh, emotionally taxing, uh, to be fully transparent. Um, um, I think an Abraham moment coming to the land where you don't know anyone, where no one knows you, leaving all your kindred behind. Um, but it's also been uh, extremely powerful for us. Um, the Georgetown first, we'll start there, was not um, in particular something that we were looking for. I remember um, uh, in January coming and walking these streets during inauguration and being knowing I was on Holy Spirit assignment. Um, everyone saying I was crazy uh, for being in the city uh, during inauguration time, but but hearing Holy Spirit saying that this was a place where my husband and I would move our family um, by July of, of this year. And so I did not know what that looked like based on the cost of living alone. Um, and I remember waking up at 2 a.m. one particular morning and being told by Holy Spirit to go, go just Google Georgetown. Um, and when I did, the position for resident minister was open and we applied and um, did what I thought was a not so great interview um, and they offered us that job. And so we are able to live on the campus um, um, with the students in a dormitory with all freshmen. Um, and so uh, that's really exciting uh, for me. Um, last year though, I started adjuncting uh, at Colgate Rochester um, and had been doing that now for about a year and a half, three semesters, and um, was invited to come during their lecture week uh, to talk about my documentary and to present it. Actually, they asked if they could premiere the documentary. It had been done and completed um, as my doctoral work, and then I put it on the shelf, um, as I often do. And so they asked if, um, if they could premiere it during their lecture week, and of course, I was honored. Um, and from that, I received the job offer if I would be willing to become the director for their doctoral program. And so um, being on the campus of one institution and, and doing the work virtually from the other institution. I've not yet stepped foot um, on Colgate Rochester's campus ever. I've never met uh, the president of the institution. It's not a job I applied for. Um, and so when God opens the door and it is a door of that magnitude, um, who am I not to walk through it? And so, um, so, it's so hold, been, on, hold on, it's been hold on. I, I think someone might have missed that. So, so you are the dean of the doctorate of ministry program at Colgate yes, Rochester, and you just said you you you, you never. I think somebody never missed stepped that. foot. <laughs> never stepped foot on the campus. Have never met the president who extended the uh, the job offer. Um, never applied for, filled out an application. I don't even know if I sent an official transcript. They have a copy of a transcript, uh, and so um, it was it was a God thing. Um, and so the both both things were coastal and, and all of the concerns that we had about the transition uh, when we heard in, in January that we would move by July um, was around housing. And Georgetown said, don't worry about it. If you come, we'll cover it. You don't even have to pay for Internet here. Uh, we got you covered um, if, if you if you and your family will come. Um, and then uh, Colgate Rochester came with with the salary. And so God has been faithful and God <laughs> has, has has provided. And so. Um, even on the the tough days, like full, full transparency, last week was a rough week. Um, but on Sunday, when I finished a conference, I was I was working. Um, I went and sat out in the front yard, and it was like, Negro, you live on Georgetown's campus. 
right? <laughs> Sitting out there on the grass looking against like Negro. You live right above, like you're in, you're on Georgetown's campus and you ain't paying to live here. Like you're literally situated, positioned, you know, um, at the seat, at the helm, at the seat of power for our country. And so I'm, I'm excited about whatever that means uh, for, for the, the near and distant future. So yes, ma'am. Wow. Wow. So um, one of the questions um, that, that we have for you is mm -hmm. what does it mean to bring a fresh perspective to yeah. what it means to do ministry as the body of Christ? Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you put in your doctoral work and even in your bio that you believe that the church is called to pray and be present. So, mm -hmm. so, so kind of unpack all of that for us. So what, what does it mean to bring a fresh perspective to ministry? So, you know, so, you know, um, so fresh perspective for ministry, let's start there. Like, I think in particular, particularly during uh, pandemic time, I, I'm leaning forward because I got excited just then, um, <laughs> that particularly during pandemic time, right? I think that we have, we have, we have seen the necessity of living into what it means to do ministry differently. Um, what it means to, to think outside of literally the four walls, not figuratively, but literally we've been looking at computer screens now for almost two years um, for the vast majority of us who've not re-entered into, into church. And so, um, but, but pre-pandemic, there was definitely a need to look and say, we are doing something wrong. The numbers for, uh, for, for church, black church in particular, are declining. It's really church in general, but I'll, I'll talk about our context. Black church in particular is our, those numbers are declining. And I believe, um, and I think that the COVID time has, has, has borne it out, is that it's because we continue to try and do church the same way because it is what makes us comfortable, because it is what we know, because it is the safe thing to do. And so um, I think it was one of my colleagues who said very early on um, in pandemic time last week, Facebook was the devil this week. Y'all calling on us because you needed to keep your churches open, right? And so having a fresh perspective of ministry means that we are willing to say, okay, the, the end goal is that souls will be brought into the kingdom or the reindom of God, right? That, 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 that souls will be brought into the church, that lives will be changed and transformed. And so does it matter if we do uh, church liturgically the way that we normally would? Does it matter? Does it really matter for those who are Methodists if we say the affirmation of faith or sing the glory for tree every single Sunday? Does it matter? You know, if, if your skirt is all the way down to your ankle, does it really matter, right? So, so having a fresh perspective of ministry means that the end goal does not change, but the means by which we reach that goal, right, is, are, are that they're, they're, they're fluid, right, that these things shift, right, as we, as we talk about and embrace, as you all have done, you know, tremendously well with over the last year or so, you know, really, really delving into this notion of Holy Spirit, that the Spirit, the wind will blow, and the wind will blow, and we don't know where it's coming from, we don't know where it's going, but in church, we try to have this very static, this very stagnant, right perspective of what it means to do ministry and sometimes ministry is just you putting on your baseball cap and going sitting on the corner and have a conversation with somebody sometimes it's going and just just not even worrying about today we're not going to worry about the order of worship but we're going to put ourselves in the posture of worship and see what that looks like right bringing a new perspective a fresh perspective to ministry means that we're willing to we're willing to experiment and see and covid has forced us to do that, to try and see what works and what doesn't, not because we wanted to, because we had to, lest our churches shudder at the, by the time the pandemic had, was, was three or four months in. Um, and then the, the, the pray and be present part. So when we first got ready to go to Ferguson, my, my, my natural mother is probably watching or will catch the replay. And so she'll tell you, I'm not lying, right? Um, is that she and I like had this knock down, drag out conversation about whether or not my husband and I should go to Ferguson. Now, part of it was because she needed to be the babysitter while we went. Okay, so that let's 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 be fully transparent all around, around that. But she had real issues, you know. Um, and and my mom wasn't the only one when we got to Ferguson, right? Denominationally, okay, we were we were told that we we didn't need to go. We just needed to pray. Right. And so for me, um, that that pray and, and be present was kind of the mantra we picked up, because as we got there, people would say, oh, no, well, the church isn't called to be out there with them. Uh, we're just supposed to pray for them as if they were not our children. 
right? As if they as, as if they were not children who were whose grandparents went to church or whose parents were raised in church. They might not have been willing to step foot in church anymore, right? But they were the children and the grandchildren, the great grandchildren of those who had. And so the idea of praying and be, being present goes along with faith without works is dead. Yes, pray, but if you're not willing to pray and then put your put your money where your prayers are or your boots or your feet where your prayers are, then you know, then then have a seat. And so I and so it's it is my belief, my understanding that God calls us, yes, to offer prayers, but God also calls us to offer service and to offer presence and to offer resources and finances. And if and and, and that one cannot exist outside of the other and we truly be doing effective ministry. Wow. Um, you, you got really excited. Dr. Bradford, I see that Dr. Yes. Sanders has commented. Do you want to <laughs> yes, bring that up? There are, I mean, there are a few things that she said, but the, mm -hmm. the, the last thing she said, we love the familiar, which is so often power. Let me go back up. Some bishops, and I quote, were actually torn as to whether people could have communion at home. Mm. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a real thing. That's a real um, thing. Rochelle Daniel says, we need to ask why we're not why we're not willing to go into the church, maybe because we had rejected them. Them is a whole Indeed. narrative. Yeah, so you're right. And so Dr. Bradford, I see that you put that in the comment that them is a whole narrative. And you and you mentioned them in in, in your excitement there, Dr. Hill. Uh who 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 who, who, who is them? them that who's them that them you talking about? So so them is and and I look I them is the them that the church folk kept talking about it, them and they and those, right? And so we never acknowledge the church in general never acknowledged that these young folks out in the street actually belonged to the people in the church. We 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 ne we never made the co the the connection. We never we never affirmed, right? The 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 personhood of these young people and so the it, it happened as it happened in church those young people or those kids or those children right um the problem though when we talk go go back to fresh perspective and ministry the problem is that those children those young people those kids you still expect their tithes if they come to your church you still would like their butts in your seats but when they go to the streets and they do something or they they present themselves in a way that is not appropriate right that's that 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 suggests that they might not have any home training Right then, it's them and they and those. Um, and and to to to, to my sorrow, Chris Cheryl's uh, uh, question, you know, why they didn't want to go to church? Right. Well, well, to be honest, many of us, many of us don't always want to go to church. We go because of a sense of obligation. And the reason we don't want to go to church is because we don't like the foolishness that we see in church. And because, but but because we are highly churched. We Girl, tolerate oh, and we wow. put up wait, with the foolishness. Wait, mm, wait, right? wait, we highly churched, right? Raised in church. You know, we we wait. the ones that can, that can fill in all the blanks. My bed wasn't my cooling wait, board. My sheet wasn't my wait. winding chain. Wait. My eyes wasn't glued to the, you know, you know, my eyes wasn't glued shut. My tongue wasn't at the top of my mouth. You know, so so we the highly church saints. First giving honor to God who was the head of my life. Okay, we, we them saints. But the young folks in the streets, had an attachment or at least a, a a connection not even attached they had a connection to church but they were not committed to the institution of church and if we're honest and i think i've said this before is that it was not that they rejected church in general they rejected the institutional the institution of the church which if we're honest was worthy of the rejection it received mm -hmm. and so those young people became the church when the church was absent they fed each other. They clothed each other. They gave each other shelter. That's what we did in those streets. White respectability. And so the church looked though, and said, "But because you know what? Well, Why? Because I can see your draws. Because you. Because we hear you cussing. Because you know, y'all church folks cuss. They just don't let everybody else hear them cussing. Because the young folks was cussing in public, ah, ah. it became a problem. Mm, you gonna help somebody oh, today, girl? I." I'm sorry, I got excited. No, that's, that's, that's 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 you know, you went right yeah. at my heart. But I, I want to know. <laughs> wait a minute. Before we <laughs> wait, go there, wait, Dr. Wallace. Prophet, wait, Prophet. Wait, wait. Prophet. Prophet. That was. <laughs> Carry on. 
Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a Somebody minute. go get that bottle of oil from Christian Chapel real quick. No, that no, it up. Go ahead. Somebody get the cover. 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 The lap, lap. <laughs> well, listen. Listen. Wait a minute. I want to, before we go there, I wanted to, to kind of tap in there where um, Dr. Simmons says, why <laughs> why your respectability is still killing us? Because we continue to perpetuate the behavior that we had lived under for so many years. Stop it, it, folks. Stop it. That's it. That's it. Enjoy. Enjoy. Grant says, hey, I'm a pastor. And I don't want to go some time. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. Y'all gonna, yeah, we gonna be honest today. Yes, Jesus. Sure. Yes. You know, I yeah, love going God. to about four or five different churches on Sundays where I used to go to just one. I can see Seb, <laughs> my friends. I can see classmates. I, I, I really, um, I really like, enjoy. Uh, yes being able to visit more than one church on a Sunday morning. I, I'm I'm liking that. But but um <laughs> Dr. 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 Hill, Dr. Dr. Thompson Hill, talk to us yeah, about the 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 content of your documentary. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, ma'am. So so my doctoral work, um I we were still in the heat of Ferguson um when I began my doctoral program at Perkins. And so uh, we we had come out of come out of the everyday protest. The children had just stopped being in the streets because um, they they again I give this plug um, really really showed us what it means to be committed to the ministry you're called to um, for more than a hundred days straight. Really really significantly more than a hundred days straight. Um, they they went in those streets, rain, sleet, shine, or snow, um, and so. Um, as I began my doctoral work, and it was around uh, preaching and worship, um, what I hoped to look at and what I desired to look at was the, the ethical responsibility that accompanies the call to preach. Um, but as I looked at that, um, in light of what was taking place in Ferguson, it quickly shifted to my asking the question, what exactly, and, and, and noting significant church absence, right? Um, and some folks going to argue with me on that. It's fine. We can talk about it. Um, but significantly, significant church absence, and particularly in my context, Black Methodist church absence, um, I began to ask the question, what is it, are we, what, what are we preaching by our absence, right? Going, going on the notion that, that whether we open our mouths or not, that by what we do or choose to do or choose not to do, that we're preaching without ever saying anything. And so my question was, what are we preaching? What are we proclaiming by our choice to be absent or present in a space during social crisis, during protests, during conflict. Um, and so um, we were, when we first went to Ferguson, we're just documenting. We didn't go there with the intent to, 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 be, to make a documentary, but it's the nature of who I am. I've got three cameras sitting on my desk right now uh, to take pictures and video of where I am. And so um, when I started the doctoral program, uh, it was Dr. Evelyn Parker who helped me kind of hone it down a little bit and say, you can't look at all the church. So let's look at let's look at, at your context or the context you have access to. Um, and so we looked at um, the involvement of the three historic or three of the historic black Methodist bodies. That is the CME Church, AME Church and AME Zion uh, in Ferguson and other spaces of conflict, which uh, which included it came to include. Uh, Freddie Gray. And so the documentary looks at some of the footage that we took while we were there in Ferguson and also in Baltimore, um, but also goes back to have a conversation uh, with, with some of the, the activists that were there, but also with some theologians and scholars. And so uh, one of the clips uh, that I want to show you all um, is of, of Bishop John Bryant, who, uh, who I actually met as a result of um, an effort by the by the Black Methodist bodies to respond. Um, he, he called together the other two senior bishops, uh, Bishops Battle and Bishop Reddick, um, to, to ask them to put forth, a to put together a task force. Um, and so I met him that way. And so he was a significant voice uh, for me. If I can play, if I can play that clip, I think you begin to get an idea um, of, of what we see uh, in, the, in the film. Uh, let me do here. <laughs> The church, in his in its absence, left has left God. Um, Emmanuel, 
God with us. And that's that's what we're called to be. Uh, passage of scripture I like in the fifth chapter of Matthew um, says these words and 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 seeing the multitude he went up in a high mountain and when he was set they came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying the key is and seeing the multitude and seeing the people. Um, there is such a thing as absent presence, to be present and yet absent. Was talking to uh, some men at their men's ministry, and I talked about absent fathers, but almost as damnable are fathers who are physically present but emotionally and spiritually absent. So that is a um, a piece, and, and Bishop Bryant's entire piece is I was sitting there crying um, as as he was as he was talking through. But he goes on to talk about as he talks about the church being present, physically present, but absent in every other way. Um, and he shares, he says, you know, he said, I, I believe that the church took a little hiatus. He says they, they took a little nap. Um, he said, and the problem is that while the church was napping, everybody else came awake. Um, all the children came awake. The young people came awake. The young people began to say, ouch. Um, he said, and then we decided that we wanted to come in and say to them how to say, ouch. Um, and he so, so, so he talked about, he said, you know, he said, I think that because we are, we have become used to being the leaders. He said, I, I tried to say to people that they didn't need us to come in and to lead them. They needed us to come in uh, and hold their arms up. Um, another clip uh, here is from Dr. Pamela Lighty, who is um, a, a queer womanist theologian uh, now in Chicago, Illinois. And Dr. Lighty was a the dean. She was my dean uh, when I was at Garrett Evangelical. Um, but she had she had left and gone to Boston, Boston University um, by the time Ferguson had taken place. And so it was through watching her live streams. Um, that that I knew that Ferguson was something uh, something that I wanted to be a part of and indeed something God was calling me to. So I want to share um, this little clip. And she was there on the ground in Ferguson, arrived before we did uh, by a few weeks. Um, and so she's able to give um, really a notion of how she saw what her hopes were, but then also what she saw um, from, from the clergy uh, when she arrived. I hoped that I would see the black church involved uh, in a collaboration with that community. Uh, and I hope that that collaboration would be a healthy collaboration. That is to say that I did not want to see black clergy um, on the streets supervising, so to say, a protest. And in truth, I saw some collaboration, but I also saw uh, at points the absence of Black clergy. And in other points where I saw Black clergy, I saw Black clergy being manipulated by the state, uh, and by manipulated, I mean, and 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 this is not. I, I'm not saying this to uh, denigrate the work of clergy because I I think sometimes when you're in the thick of it, you don't actually understand you're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, what took place was at the end of every night, clergy were being asked to with Force Sergeant Johnson, who was leading the, the police, I'm sorry, the police work before he gave his nightly report, he would often have local clergy lead in a prayer. Uh, and that for myself and other persons who were on the ground, 
seemed to be a strange place for clergy to be. Now, I know some people say, well, prayer is always necessary. Prayer is always necessary. But in this case, what was actually happen happening was that clergy were actually kind of baptizing the work um, of the uh, of the police on the ground and the military forces on the ground. Baptizing, she says. They were baptizing, right? The work of the police forces and and of the, the military on the ground. And so so Dr. Wallace, the, the, the documentary is filled with kind of these accounts of, of the black church being there. Um, black church being present. Dr. Lightsey is United Methodist, um, and so still consider her to be Black Methodist. Um, but being there, but some, some some doing good work, but others, to use her language, baptizing, almost condoning, putting themselves um, putting themselves um, in in direct opposition of of the young people, you know that 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 were a part of them, or that they said that they were there to to, to support. They they almost allowed themselves to be put in a, a supervisory role rather than one of standing with those who, who were suffering and those who were who were who were saying ouch um, as Bishop Bryant would say. So yes ma'am. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's 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 awesome because it it re, it just moves right into our next question about what it looks like to do social justice. And to me, the black church should be at the forefront. Uh, one of our um, former guest said that social justice was salvation, you know, until we find a way to find social justice in the church and in the streets. That's what salvation looks like um, for us. So, so talk to us about what social justice looks like for you. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we, we heard Bishop Bryant say to what you just said, we heard Bishop Bryant say, um, you know, that the church in his absence has left God. Um, you know, there, there is, I think it is um, um, the scripture in Micah that says, what does the Lord require of us, right? Um, to do justice, to walk humbly. Um, and, and so I think that, that for me, um, that, that for the church to, that to have a passion for social justice is indeed um, to, 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 to do what it is that God has called us to do on a very fundamental basis, on a very fundamental level. Uh, to understand that that in a, in addition to or as a part of our preaching, that as a part of our worship, they were also called to look among us and ask the question, who's missing? Why are they missing? What's causing them to be missing? Um, and oftentimes we will find that 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 factor that's causing them to be missing is oftentimes oppression, whether it be oppression that that we have caused, oppression that is systemic or societal. Um, uh, it, 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 there are a number of things that we have the ability to look for and to see and to name, right? I don't think that we that we fully embrace as church and as believers, right? Um, the, we we only we only claim we only name it and claim it when it's beneficial for us, right? The the power of life and death is only in our tongue when it has to do with something that we're going to get. But but if we can begin to understand our own power, right, as the church to name, right? Part, Part of why so much stuff slips under the rug, right, is because nobody names it. Nobody with any authority simply says, I, I see what's taking place, right? The foolishness that we talked about earlier, I see it, I'm going to name it, I'm going to call it out. I'm going to speak truth, not only to power, but I'm going to speak it with power. Right. And so so to do and to have a passion for social justice and for activism in the church is to acknowledge the power that is within us, but also the very fundamental and basic call that is upon our lives as believers, not even as preachers, but as believers that we are called to walk humbly, that we are called to do justice, to love mercy. Right. I, the, the number of people who who the number of black people, I can't tell you how just how 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 ticked off I was, right? At the number of church people who said to me, well, he shouldn't have been walking in the street anyway. Well, he shouldn't have stole those cigarettes anyway. Well, he shouldn't have been selling cigarettes out the store anyway. To love mercy, we better love mercy because all of us are benefactors of what we naturally deserve being with help from us. And so on a very fundamental basis, very, very foundational basis, 
that to be a believer is indeed to have a passion for social justice and activism. Otherwise, what are we doing other than coming to church and clapping our hands and putting offering in a plate and giving a courtesy drop and sling It's not Like, what are we doing? And why are we doing it? Sunday is not what we are called to. Sunday is a benefit of being who we are. That we have the opportunity to come and to be filled up. But our worship, our reasonable service is that we take what has been given to us and we extend it by the power and the grace of God and the power of Holy Spirit that we extend it to others. That is what it means. I don't know how we can be the church and not have a passion for activism and justice. I don't know how a George Floyd happens and a pastor gets up and preaches what they planned to preach last year. I don't know how how a Michael Brown or Trayvon Martin happens and a service does not come to a halt the following Sunday to address it, whether it be a black church or a white church. I don't know how the youth department, members of the youth department are out in the streets marching but the seniors and the elders in the church are not saying anything. And we say to ourselves, but we we save, sanctify, going water baptized, tongue talking, going on to heaven anyhow. The devil is a lie. And so are we. And we misinformed. We are misinformed. You cannot. I will say it and say it strongly. You can't be a for real believer. You can't be a for real Christian and not have a passion for justice. I answer your question. Y'all got quiet on me. Whoa. Oh, my God, today. That's because you unleashed a volley on us. Mm. My God. Mm. Powerful. Powerful. Burns, you, you're on mute. She's still on mute. You're on mute, Burns. There, <laughs> there you go. No. Turn on her mic. Light her I candle. Her on. I think she just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, I mean, I mean, that is so powerful, and it is so yeah. true to be that we have to be more than just let's pray, let's pray. And mm -hmm. and so many times I think of our young women uh, struggling having questions and and trying to figure things out and then they come in and they pour their heart out and they say well you know I, I'm, I'm messing with this guy and I'm still messing with him. baby we just gonna pray you just gonna have to tell the Lord to pop well, what if I don't want to pray right now what 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 if I I, I, I ain't feeling that right now you know I need a solution <laughs> Dr. Hill what what do you recommend? for the church and the age of George Floyd? So, so I think there, there's a few things. First, in, in, in many ways, I think that the church, um, we're, we're women, but, and I, but I don't know how, how else to say it. The church needs to grow some, right? Um, and we need to, we need to, to, to position ourselves um, in a place where we're willing to open our mouths and to, and to to call out what we see. But the other part of that is, I think that's twofold, um, particularly for those of us who are members of denominations, but even you know independent churches, whatever that looks like, um, is that we have to also be willing to look and ask ourselves the really hard questions internally, self-examination, ask ourselves the really hard questions internally, um, who's, who's net do we have our knee on Ooh. right that's that's important that's really important for for our brothers who are in ministry who are not receptive to sisters in ministry you have your knee on our necks to our sisters in ministry who are haters for their other sisters in ministry which doesn't even make sense we have our knees on each other's necks when we when we despise or 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 devalue the voices of young people in our churches. We have our knees on their necks when we forget about or disregard our elders in the church. We have our knees on their necks. And so we we can't go about doing the work of calling anybody else out if we're not gonna call ourselves out first, right? And so I think I think it begins there that we have some real work to do. That we that we have to acknowledge the fact that that as the church we have gotten out of position. 
We've lost that. We've lost. We've lost our posture, and and so doing, we've missed our purpose, huh? And so, so, so I think that that's part of it. That we are that that we reposition ourselves. That we put ourselves back in a posture where we're saying, okay, God, really, really, what must what, what must we do to stay saved? Right at this at this juncture, how 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 do we truly do and walk out this call that you have on our lives? The other part, right, in a real practical way, though, is I think that we have to figure out how to create safe spaces and listening spaces, um, and and that that is is one thing that I've not seen done well in many places. I've seen it done extremely well in some places. And I'm not just saying it because it's my church, but but Christian Chapel has done it well over the years. Right. It's my church, even though I live in D.C. It's still my church. Mind y'all business. All right. Um, but creating those those listening spaces where people can truly come and be transparent without judgment, even if those are people who you've known since they were children. Um, and, and, and to create a space where 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 people are welcome. One of the pastors said I was in at a roundtable uh, that, that Jamal Bryant invited. Um, me and some others to post Ferguson. It was about a year later, coming up on the year anniversary, I think. And we were sitting across, there were some preachers, and we were sitting across from some of the local activists. And one of the preachers sitting near me had the audacity to say, well, they didn't invite us to come. And the activist said, why did we have to invite you to come? Why do we have to invite you to come? Why wouldn't you just come because you saw us suffering? Why wouldn't you just come? Why wouldn't you just open your doors to us and allow us to come and be safe? And she began to list off how people in neighborhoods had opened their doors, how white churches had opened their doors, how community organizations had opened their doors. But we didn't. We closed our doors because they were going to get the carpet dirty, because they were cussing, because they wouldn't put their pants up, because we could see their bellies, because their shorts were too short. We closed our doors for dumb stuff. And when we did it, we preached to them a sermon that said, you are not welcome here. And so we've got to figure out how we how we recultivate our spaces. And really, you know, COVID has given us that opportunity because y'all don't know who, who going to your church on Sundays. You on Facebook. You don't know who's coming to your church. And guarantee if they have on the top, if they got one on, you can't guarantee they got on no bottoms. And so it's, it's too short by default. Right. And so we've got to find how we stretch and how we create a space that says to all of God's children, you're welcome. As the black church, we have become like the white church who said we could not worship inside their doors. We've become like the white churches to our own people who said you can't worship on the same. You got to go to the balcony. You still stand outside the door. We have begun to treat people the same way. And so after we do self-examination, we've got to figure out how to cultivate that space and ask ourselves whose neck do I have my knee on? And really to ask the question, why? I think that why not, you know, and, I, and I, don't, I don't have the answer to why, but I think if we can ever, ever muster up the courage to ask ourselves why and answer it truthfully, that we we sit on on the, the, the cusp of what it is to witness the next revival in our nation, if not the world. Bishop Bryan opens up his statement that I didn't show you. He said, it's a mighty good time to be the church. It is. But it's also a volatile time to be the church. The post-pandemic church will be a church that is that 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 will be under heavy critique. And if we can't stand up to, to the critique, we own our way out of here. Woo! My God. Standing up to the critique or withstanding the critique. Um that we at we need to ask ourselves that same questions in our own lives. The church, yeah. the community. How do we walk into the community? Are we do we walk with such posture that we are more, or are we with? This is good stuff. So you're asking, you're saying leadership. You're offering the leadership qualities. You're recommending the leadership qualities uh, for preachers today um, in this activism ministry. But how how do you, or what are the leadership qualities needed for preachers? Yeah. And I know I think of your of your generation, actually. So that that's that is um that that's a legitimate question. And even though I'm I, I'm, I'm always hard on um on, on the seasoned on, on, on our elders, um, I try to be equally as hard on, on my own peers. Um, and and, in, and, and in, Dr. Hill, ma'am. And Dr. Hill. And while you're you're answering that as our time is drawing close, 
I, I see also a question from one of our viewers, if you can kind of put those together, what does or should the post-pandemic church look like? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, so for, for activists and preachers, um, young and old, but of my generation, it, we find it oftentimes difficult to be teachable. Um, that, that has been a conversation I've had um, with a lot of my peers. Um, and it's not that we think that we know it all. That's not been my experience, but it's been that we've been, we felt, um, I won't say been, we felt rejected um, so much by by the church, um, not, as I said earlier, being open or receptive or welcoming to the fullness of who we are, um, that we've made our decisions that we simply going to teach. We, we, we are the generation of self-taught, right? We are the generation of YouTube and of self-taught. And so if I taught myself because you didn't, because you wouldn't, um, or because you couldn't find or bring, bring, it, bring yourself to teach me and allow what you taught me to, to take shape inside the fullness of who I am, then I don't really have anything um, to, to any, any reason to listen to you. And I think that we've done that in error. Um, I, I think that, that we have lost the appreciation for what it means to sit at the feet of our elders, to sit at the feet of the prophets and to learn. Um, and I think that that's important. I think that we have to be flexible, um, that even though um, we can see what we may perhaps perceive to be a better way, um, that there are paths that have been paved before us, uh, not that we yield to them, but that we find a way to integrate them in the path that we forge forward. Um, and then finally, that we find some consistency. Again, we are the generation of side hustles, of gigs, of the whole nine. And so we are not the ones who are going to sit down and stay at the same job for 40 or 50 years. That's why divorce is as high as it is, because we decide hustle. We decide hustle crew, right? Um, that we want to we want to move as we want to move. We might be interested in one thing today and, and buy all the stuff forward and not be interested tomorrow. I'm guilty and unapologetic for it. Um, but we have to learn to find some consistency when it comes to the church and ministry so that we can have um, a sense of legitimacy, but also so that we can have our longevity and and um, and reliability. Right. Those those things are important um, in terms of what the what the post pandemic church should look like. Um, I think it is. Um, it is a church that understands that it must be fluid. It is a church that understands that the way that it does things may work today and may not work tomorrow and has to be willing to shift and to change with the changing of times and with the changing of, of, of the needs of the people and the community. The post-pandemic church has to be a church that is willing to, to examine itself, is willing to look among itself to see what the problem may have been. Um, it has to be a church that's willing to be honest that's willing to be transparent, that's willing to be vulnerable, and here's the hard one, that's willing to be accountable to people and to places that it has not been accountable to before. Ain't nobody paying tithes no more, and you can't tell us how the money's being spent. We don't see no ministry in the community. Nobody's sitting in church for eight hours anymore, and nobody's being transformed or set free or delivered. Nobody's coming just because my grandmother came there. We want something, we're hungry, we're thirsty, and that is why people are coming to the church. It's a mighty fine time to be the church, but the church better step up. The church better step up and realize that it has it has some real questions to answer, even as we've seen it in this pandemic. Some do well and some have faulted and not done so well. I hope I answered your question. Amen. Right. Ooh, Lord. Let, me, let me share this in one of the comments. Social um Connie, Reverend Connie Jackson says, social justice activism can't be a church ministry. It has to be the culture. Just the ethos. That's it right there. This has been absolutely wonderful. Dr. Shazetta Thompson Hill, um, thank you. Today Bravo. has been absolutely wonderful. I, 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 can, I continue to say to you that I am extremely proud of you. Yeah. I'm very happy thank about you. the journey that you're on, that you and your husband have taken. Thank you um, for today. Just a splendid um, in your face, a uh, Shazetta Thompson Hill kind of style of telling us off um, in the church. Here we go. Here we go. Here we, we go. Here 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 we go. Without, without apology, just, just, you just came and told us off. And then folk want to want to know why we don't hear more from the millennials. Well, we, we need a few weeks in between. Y'all need a break. Um, you all now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get no break That's from we'll get no break from y'all, but y'all need a break from us. <laughs> Carry on. We'll keep tuning in to the next time. All <laughs> Drop in the mic. Thank you all. Thank you. This all. is powerful. This has been powerful. Next week.
We have oh, none so other than so the, much, Doctor. Um, Dr. Hill, have a good day. Next week, Say, we have hang, none hang other around than Reverend Dr. Elaine Flake. Come on in. Mm -hmm. See us next week. Same time, same place. Yeah. God bless you all.